Pal uh, kind of connection through punk magazine. <laughs> and then he got <laughs> discovered by a detective and got returned home before oh. he could be <laughs> in the boys' high school. So there's a, there's a secret <laughs> a, a celebrity right over there. We did one photo <laughs> session, but that was before we got the Yeah. That's the one thing about New York. You could do photo sessions before you even played it. <laughs> 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 I do that out here too. Which <laughs> sounds very <laughs> Hollywood, but in fact, uh, it is. Did you mention John Holmstrom's punk magazine? Is that what that you got? There? That old thing? <laughs> he was like the grandfather of punk. Like his, he was so anti-punk. I have to say, he's friends with me on Facebook, so I probably shouldn't say this. Yeah, yeah. But he was kind of a, a very heterosexist guy who had one idea of punk that was kind of like the Standells. He wanted to be that that the very specific idea of what punk rock was, and he wasn't welcoming to new people. I remember when Pleasant Gaiman finally got me an article in the punk magazine, and it was just like it was. He, she had to force it on him. Well, he was such a big Ramones fan. It's like Ramones in every issue. Yeah, he. Yeah, was, I couldn't even get in punk magazine because he was just hated. He had his ear on the street. See there. There was Pam, let, let, we can share that. No, wait, no, Pam Brown. <laughs> he had he he had us interview Billy Idol when he was still in Generation X, and um, he rejected the interview because it wasn't funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I love you because you're my friend on Facebook. I didn't say yes, that. Hi, I take it all back. Hello, Facebook. Um, the next question uh, for Paul. Um, you know, the Fast was such a important. Uh, band on the New York scene spanning glam and punk eras um, uh, where, you know, any behavior was accepted. Uh, could a band like The Fast or Man to Man, could that happen in today's climate? Well, the Fast didn't happen in that climate, so I guess <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. You know, I mean, uh, being, you know, at the top of the D-list was just, uh, you know, something, you know, my brother Mickey and I, we... we you know, we tried to escape from the punk scene as quick as we could because we didn't get a major record label. So, uh, luckily, we made it out alive. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and were able to pursue other things. And but, then you uh, had a number one hit. Like, well, we did have yeah. a number one hit. So, that does yeah. So, you know, you do Woo! Too, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. But early so, on, the fast was more popular. And everybody was yeah. and the Ramones. And, and, yeah, you know. I mean, uh, you, you know, we... we Played at all the venues and with all the bands, and you know, equal or headlining on the bill, and uh, and we were managed by Max's, and I was also the DJ there, so that made it easy. Uh, every band that came to New York from out of town were our opening act, B52s and people like that, and even bands that the Cramps, Cramps, and he has a book so, out. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> a fucking great book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, and there it is. I did it. He That's did a really it. fun book. <laughs> it's a fucking great book. Uh, yeah, there's, um, there's nothing like it. Uh, I'm uh, in it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, and and uh, I, I I made a point of putting all of uh, all of the bands that everyone knows, but I made a point of putting all of the bands, designers, photographers that didn't make it. Because I felt that was a really important thing. Anybody that's in a scene or nurtures one knows that not only the people that make it were influential. So I would think uh, so many of the designers, photographers, and writers and that didn't make it were just as important as the ones that did. So uh, I made sure to put all of those people in it and talk about them. And it's really funny when I did talk to a lot of people, like when some of the Ramones were still around, and of course Debbie and Blondies and people, they always thank me for, you know, talking about people like Natasha and Tish and Snooki and Tish and Snooki. Yeah. People that were, you know, fashion conscious, not only Anna Sue and Stephen Sprouse, but you know, and it comes to bands like that also. I mean, every band was playing and they had crowds just as much as all the others. It's just uh, that things happen that Time. they don't get the... And, and there's a... I, I, I pulled out, I made a whole list of all the one album hit wonder major label artists the other day. And all there the was a lot, And there was a lot of them from New York that made their one album, but, uh, you know, it was a shame that they didn't catch on. Like, no one would have expected television not to be the biggest band out of New York. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't happen. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, at the beginning, Blondie was just, as people would say, they were everyone's favorite opening act. But all of us there knew, uh, you know, that they were very good, of course, and fun, and, you know, deserved everything. But, you know, a lot of the bands deserve to be popular and have their chance. But uh, it was the people at the record labels that didn't know what they were doing. And Tommy and Laura Dean had a lot to do with Peter. All yeah, everybody. yeah. But, you know, uh, every time... Uh, record labels would come see the fast our manager who owned uh, Max's uh, let them uh, told the record companies that they had to sign Max's label and Max's productions in order to, <laughs> to get us to be their band so so there was things that went on like that and you know the Dead Boys and CBG we had a lot of problems Aww. because of stuff like that so it was, it was you know everybody had to deal with management and no management so those things still went on, even though it was a real underground scene. Everybody still had their problems. Right. right. One, one thing I'd like to say very quickly is you're, you're underselling yourself. Because, uh, I don't care about the microphone. Uh, but in any case, he he made, uh, you connected everyone with everybody. Like when Lance and I first came to New York, he somehow found us, brought to, us to one of the shows you were doing at the Diplomat or wherever it was, yeah. and Mickey was throwing Cheerios under a strobe light on the audience or something, but you connected us with the Ramones and with Blondie uh, and and with Max's. You were actually the great connector, and also he took us home to his house and had his mother cook dinner for us. And I remember he would, he he was trying to wash the dishes, and his dad said like. Don't you wash the dishes. Let the beauty wash the right. dishes. It was like, oh, <laughs> weird. But, but in any case, you made so much stuff happen and in New we would York. Work, you know, that's under of Harold. course, Mickey would work with the Blessed and yeah. write songs for them Something and like rehearse that. with them. And, and my other brother was you know, the, working with an old girl group. Crayola and oh yeah, uh, who, who were fantastic. Yeah, and you know, and doing demos for them, and and, and they dressed and, in Crayola cardboard yeah. boxes. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they ran out on stage like they were crayons. And then being a DJ at Max's in 74, 75, 76, people ask about it now, and they say, "Wow, it must have been great playing all the, those punk records." And it's like, there were "No, any there weren't any punk records." <laughs> so they said, "What did you play?" So we played what we all listened to, which was you know garage music and, and 60s the raspberries and and pop, and power and pop, pop and you know bubble gum and glam. So, so that kind of stuff, basically, you could listen to any New York punk band and you could hear what influences they had and what they were listening to from the early 70s or the late 60s or mid-60s or something. Some even in the 50s. The 50s wasn't that big of an influence on a lot of groups, but, uh, you know, Cramps had a lot of uh, 50s kind of rockabilly Link stuff. Room. Rockabilly. Yeah, but they also had more, a lot of garage influences, mostly they could blend with. But, uh... Another thing that uh, I remember seeing is a lot of people saying how bad all the bands were when they started, and I just never thought that. You know, I, I, I never thought the Ramones were bad or the Mumps or Blessed or any of the bands. You know, we were all friends with each other, and everybody was, was you know, we were happy just to all be there and have friends and have bands, and, and I think it was just a lot of other people talking about or, or, or being that critical about it. And uh, I think everybody had, had their... New York was such a, a, a melting pot for different types of influences, not like England, which kind of had, you know, all of those bands had not really the same sound, but it was kind of similar. And uh, New York bands, they every every single New York band sounded completely different. I mean, I, I say the only punk band in New York was like the Dead Boys, but they really sounded like Alice Cooper and the Stooges. Mm-hmm. So, I, I don't know. Uh, and they know. did, the first time they played CBGBs, yeah. they did Anarchy and the Youth Essay. Well, they just, they the... pretended they wrote that song. <laughs> 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 they like, well, they're already post-punk in a way. Right, 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 they're right, copying right. some band from England. <laughs> and they still had long hair. Yeah. Nobody, <laughs> nobody, 